So what's up, everyone? I'm Seth Hillinger and organizer of the New York Music Tech Meetup. Here we are. Um, we've been on a bit of sabbatical um, by design. I just didn't feel like we needed to have another online event for a while. And it just didn't feel like um, who we are. I mean, our DNA is much more about meeting in, in, in person. We started in the basement of a coffee shop over 10 years ago. We've bounced around from various venues, uh, including the Knitting Factory and uh, offices that will host us. Our, our last event was at Bands in Town headquarters. That was in March, mid-March. Nobody got sick. It was a little irresponsible in retrospect, um, but it was also a really special, great event. Um, and so, I, you know, I just didn't want to take away from that. However, um, over the summer, I started to think about how, as an organizer, I could put something together that, that felt relevant. And um, eventually, we will come back to music tech pitches. Um, but we are the New York Music Tech Meetup, and there's a New York component to it. And, and so um, I've started, I just started to think about, okay, well, you know, what can we do as a music tech community to really come together and, 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 and try to make a difference? And um, the Save Our Stages movement started to, to emerge. And um, I, I am just so thankful, and we are so fortunate to have these three speakers here today um, who are all kind of on the front line of, of the Save Our Stages movement. And um, we're going to just jump right into it. Kicking it off first is going to be Justin Cantor. He is, he is a, a member of the meetup. Uh, he's got a startup as well, but um, he's also uh, founder of Le Poisson Rouge, which is an amazing event space here in New York. And then um, he is now a VP at the at Neva. So, um, Justin, why don't you turn on your camera and take it away? And just heads up, there's about a 10 to 15 second delay from when you talk to to on the other side. So, oh, well, thanks, Seth, and uh, uh, thanks for having me. And um, yeah, I guess uh, I'll chat a little bit about um, the trajectory from the beginning of the pandemic till today. Um, yeah, I'm the co-founder of, of Le Poisson Rouge. It's a music venue in, in Greenwich Village. Um, that is, I guess, would have been thir uh, 12 years old in July of, of this year um, and planning on being 13 years old in July of next year. Um, we definitely had a you know, a shock to our system in, in March um, when we chose to shut down even before it was um, made um, made a requirement to do so. Uh, we just, we could see that that was the direction it was going. And um, yeah, it's, it's a tough decision. We at the time thought maybe it was gonna last a month or two. And, you know, here we are. And then basically, right around that same time I was connecting with as many kind of venue operators as I could just to try to figure out what everyone else was doing and what their thoughts were and where um, and as well as trying to start maybe some sort of you know online meetup group for operators I also knew quite a few through through my this this tech product that I was uh, I'm still working on um, called venue pilot but we ended up finding that there's this uh, the independent venue week was gathering a lot of steam with um, venue operators meeting weekly to talk about what was going on in, in, in early March. And uh, um, through that through that organization, we decided to start the, the National Independent Venue Association. Um, and it was, uh, I guess, the originally suggested by Hal Rio from World Cafe Live, the idea of maybe starting something and trying to get some lobbying. And at the time, outside of like music nerds, I guess, no one would really know what an independent venue was. Um, so we knew we had quite a, quite a huge uphill battle um, in terms of just getting the awareness 
Um, but we organized really quickly, um, formed the association, um, have a board of, of, of five members and an executive director. Who, um, the executive director is, is, is Moose, uh, Reverend Moose, he goes by, um, and he is the, he operates Marauder, which is a, pub, um, a publicity company for music. And um, that's and also the organizer of Independent Venue Week. And um, the uh, board members are all venue operators from around the country. The president is Dana Frank from First Avenue. Um, and uh, Hal Riel from World Cafe Live. Steve Sternshine is uh, in, from Austin, Texas and runs Heard Presents. Um, um, Steve Chilton is uh, owns a Rebel Lounge in in Phoenix, Arizona, and um, yeah, and myself and yeah, I think I mentioned everyone. Yeah, and so we just kind of hit the ground. We kind of all took different roles and what we thought we could do best within the organization, and uh, hired a lobbying firm, and that was early March, and. Um, worked hard to build as much of an impact as possible. And one thing that we realized is, um, unlike a lot of other industries, independent venues have access to huge mailing lists uh, because uh, we're, you know, and promoters basically. Uh, so we were able to tap into that and very quickly create a lot of pretty big waves. Um, we were able to get uh, an art, uh, a letter signed to Congress by over 600 artists. I'm going to just post it in the chat so you can all check it out. Um, and also, um, by July, we had enough momentum that we actually had senators um, from across the aisle, one Republican, John Cornyn, and a, and a Democrat, Amy Klobuchar, author a bill specifically for independent venues. So between Mar from March to July, we were able to get enough um, uh, just word out like publicity for a general public to really under to really understand that there is this thing called independent music venues and that we're totally shut down with no way to make any sort of um, revenue until we can reopen again. And so they authored the Save Our Stages Act. And even at the time they authored it, we thought it was like a total pipe dream that there'd be an industry specific bill for um, such a small kind of unknown group, you know, we're competing with the airlines and major restaurant associations and, uh, you know, other special interest groups that have been around for decades and longer. Uh, so it was, it was a real sort of um, crapshoot that this was even going to be taken seriously. Uh, and, and now at this point, it's been, uh, it has the um, the the blessing of almost all senators and and um, House representatives um, on both sides of the aisle, and it's been in every single suggested relief package that has been. It's been a part of every relief package that has been sort of brought to. Uh, I guess what are the you know the debates um, or the, the the Senate floor, uh, the House floor, um, including the one that's being discussed right now, the, the $748 billion bill that will hopefully pass this week, uh, which would be amazing because this SOS Act, as we call it, the Save Our Stages Act, would um, provide up to 40%, 45% of 2019 gross revenue in the form of a grant to independent venues and promoters and, and live music um, operators. Um, so it's it's really, it, it would be um, an amazing lifeline that, that we really need because we're, we've just got expenses. They're not, they're not stopping, but our, our revenue is. So that's happening. Um, at the same time in, well, not the same time, maybe around July or a few months, April, maybe, actually, maybe it was closer to April. Um, time, time, time is such a weird thing right now. <laughs> like, I, I can't tell the difference between like a week or a decade. It just all feels like blurs day. Um, 
but we, I, um, I, I co co-founded the New York Independent Venue Association with Jen Lyon, who is a presenter, um, Mean Red, and we're trying to see if we could get some of the funding that came through in the in the the March um, stimulus package. All the states received uh, funding that has to be used by the end of the year. And so one of our focus and drive right now is to try to get Governor Cuomo to understand the value of and impact that our venues have on New York City's culture, but also it's, it's just its economy. Um, there's over, the state was a, a granted about a little over five billion dollars. Um, in total, it was more like seven or eight billion, but uh, a few of the billion was uh, went directly to the jurisdictions like New York. Um, but the state of this five billion, they still have. There's different numbers floating around, but it's it's well over a billion dollars of unspent, not specifically, not publicly publicly allocated, I should say, if they haven't allocated, it's, it's, it hasn't been publicly um, stated where exactly this, the funds are. Um, and it's, it's something that even if SOS passes, the amount of time that it would take for a lot of these venues to get funding is going to be too long. We're going to lose a few venues. Um, th there is a, there was a survey at the end of October that we did, um, that I'm also posting in the chat. And based on the survey, then um, we could have up to 20 venues closed by, you know, over 20 venues actually um, choose to close before the end of uh, January um, of 2021. And so we're looking for basically some sort of bridge grant funding to help save these venues. Um, the, the math works out for, the you know the the amount of risk that New York would be taking by by saving these venues, we calculated it would be about seventy five million dollars uh, to sustain the industry between now and in February. Um, but just to put it in perspective, based on a, a study done in twenty seven an impact report done in twenty seventeen by the mayor's office of media and entertainment, uh, the the live music industry within New York City alone supports over 25,000 jobs, over $720 million in wages, and has a $2.2 billion economic output with another four to $500 million um, generated in tourism dollars. So just one venue, if you sort of back into the number on average, you, could, you can almost back into the number where one single venue has an economic impact economic output within the city of $15 million. So that means if five closed, that would cost the city $75 million in e economic output. And we're looking at maybe 20 closing. Um, and that's just looking at the dollars and cents of it, not even taking into account how important live music ecosystem is to New York City's culture, New York City's or New York State's identity. Um, and what it would do in terms of the reignition, the 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 reopening of the the city when the time is right, um, and how much more difficult it will be if you don't have any sort of drivers of of um, you know drivers of. Uh, um, interest to bring people back into the city with entertainment. Um, if everyone's able to work remotely, th there needs to be some, some sort of um, reason to come back to the city, um, you know, and, and enforce when, um, when we can reopen and the live music venues are going to play a, can, can play a huge role in it. I mean, we see how um, independent venues have, impacted the growth of neighborhoods. I mean, in such a short period of time, um, Williamsburg has turned into an economic um, or one of the most expensive cities in the world, probably. 
and um, at the forefront of that, you would you could easily pinpoint the the music venues that were starting to crop up um, in the decade. So, um, uh, Craig, thank you very much. Um, for Naiva, I'm going to post something right now. Um, we created this sort of sort of tongue in cheek website, um, which will allow you to sign a petition that will go straight to the the state legislator and the and the governor. Or you can and there's also a number to text um, right from there. Um, you text sale to I think it's. I always say it wrong. I think it's 90502. Um, I'll post it in the chat in a, in a bit, but um, but that would be really helpful. Um, just we're trying to get everyone's um, voice and support for for music venues. Um, the it's a, it the state has to spend this allocation of one point whatever billion dollars that they haven't spent yet by the end of the year, or they have to return it back to the federal government. So. That's why it's like a, a we're sort of um, going full speed ahead right now, trying to trying to get some action there. And I guess if anyone wants to ask questions, or I don't know, uh, Seth, how, yeah. how would you like it to? I'll ask a question. Um, uh, I mean, just yesterday I, I heard someone from the state say that. Um, you know, uh, restaurants are a high risk because people have to take their masks off, but the subway is less of a risk because you can keep your mask on. You're not taking it off to eat food. Um, ha has there been any discussion around reopening st stages for, that you've heard of? Um, and maybe this is a better question for like Arielle when, when she comes up, but um, is there any push to, to try to do something to, to have an event? It's it's a challenge, um, you know. There's a balancing act because on the one hand, we are, as an industry we want to be responsible. We want to listen to the guidelines given by science and the rules that are and regulations that are being um, made by the state liquor authority and the you know and the governor and the mayor, um, but. There needs to also be on the the understanding that if we are to be closed and we have to pay our bills, then something has got to give. Like there needs to be some financial support for businesses that are being asked to remain closed um, for the sake of the public good um, without any sort of financial we're small businesses without any sort of financial relief it's 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 just the math doesn't work um and the other other part with specifically independent you know performance spaces that's a challenge is there are some regulations that don't really make sense in terms of how they impact independent spaces versus restaurants um and bars particularly with um, in regards to some of the regulations that the state liquor authority has put on the ability to advertise um, concerts versus uh, um, going to a restaurant. So the way that it's kind of laid out now is it's okay to have food and, and drink, I guess now just outdoors um, and you know, it's freezing. So, I mean, it, it's becoming more of a moot point, but um, earlier in the summer, it was really the challenge was we wanted to be able to put on events with the same social distancing rules that were allowed for restaurants um, with food. And but we had to be very careful because if we promoted it as a concert, it was not allowed and we would be in um, our liquor license would be in jeopardy. But if we promoted it as a food and drink with background music, sort of okay. It was, it's just the regulation, the, the, um, I think the heart was in the right place in terms of where, you know, in trying, in terms of trying to, to prevent, um, you know, concerts that would be out of control, but the logic behind how they implemented it didn't really make sense. Um, and it, it was even stranger with comedy. For some reason, comedy wasn't 
is like not allowed even outdoors. Um, mm-hmm. So, um, you know, Ariel's definitely heard a lot about that from from operators that are either confused or just just truly There's no frustrated. laughing. You're not allowed to laugh during this. There's yeah. So one of the one of the jokes was like, oh, you can have co- you might not. Are you allowed to have like not funny comments? Maybe <laughs> yeah. that's allowed. But like, <laughs> yeah. And I guess one other. I mean, you you're an entrepreneur to the core. Um, if and you're doing an amazing thing with Neva and and now with New York. Um, if say if if money wasn't a, a problem, obviously it is. But um, like if you could invent something right now that could really help uh, as a technologist thinking big, is there anything that, that could, that could change the situation that stages are in? Um, from a technology perspective, uh, everyone sort of, so the reason I'm sighing right now is because while usually I do kind of put on that cap, like, like what are some technology solutions? I love, like, I got into this business because of live music that, the. I actually don't even really like to listen to records and albums that much. Like, I just like to go to shows. Like, I like to hear the, exp- I like to be focused and connected with the music. I'm not into having music on in the background as much, you know, I'm like, and like, I don't know. Um, I like, for example, with LPR that I, the, the drive to open up LPR was to create a scene around different forms of, live music, be it uh, classical or uh, noise rock. And I don't, I didn't, I don't want to be a different business. It's not what I set out to do. It's a, it's a, it's a venue. Um, so we have the, the streaming, we do LPR TV, but that just, it's, I have no, I personally have like really no excitement or drive to um, run a business that is like a streaming right. company. Like that. Makes sense. I'm kind of with you there. <laughs> like, it, that, and, and it's the thing that I'm missing the most is being able to go to live events. Um, you just get something out of it that you can't get any other way. All right, Justin. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Um, I hope you'll you'll now hang out with uh, the rest of the group as we move on to our next speaker, and and um, and then after. After these presentations, um, you know, they're uh, in over on the left side. There's like a, a sessions button, and we're going to have like a little breakout session. So if you're available, um, actually, I know that you have a very important phone call, but maybe you can come back after that and uh, and, and rejoin us. But thanks so much, Justin, and um, virtual applause, everyone, for thank you for Justin. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Seth. Thanks, cool, everyone. Man. So next up, let's have Shane, who is joining us from London, uh, where I think it's almost uh, 8 o'clock there, if I'm not mistaken. 7 o'clock. 7, okay. Um, Shane, I'm I'm excited to have you join us next. Uh, I've been to your Music City events, uh, uh, music tourism events in the past. They are... Uh, really amazing, and if it, I just feel like if there's somebody that um, has a sense of where things are going to go when we get out of this pandemic, it's going to be you. Uh, you consult with city, Go states, ahead. governments. Um, so, so I look forward to hearing what you're up to, and 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 um, why don't you take it away? Yeah, um, this is very intimidating. Hi, everybody uh, who doesn't know me. I'm. Uh, I'm a big fan of New York, even though I'm not there. But my my name is Shane Shapiro. I'm the founder um, and CEO of a company called Sound Diplomacy. Seth says we work with cities and governments all over the world on music strategy and policy and a little bit of nighttime economy strategy as well. But Ariel is the expert there. Um, we, like everyone, have been impacted. You know, everyone's been significantly impacted by the pandemic. But as as Seth says, we have a different perspective because we um, we work in about 30 countries. We've done projects in 70 cities, about 120 projects. And we run a online platform called the Music Cities Community, 
which actually grew out of um, our events not happening because of COVID. We we wanted to still bring two people together like like you're doing here. Um, and we've got um, people from, I think, 45 odd countries uh, uh, in the Music Cities community. We kind of call it a, a meeting of music policy minds. Um, I think the first thing to set the stage, uh, no pun intended, um, is that prior to COVID, we weren't in a place um, where we had the, I believe, the policy capacity to fight for venues, fight for the music ecosystem in the way that Neva has brilliantly done uh, over the last many months. Um, you know, the music industry as a whole is, you know, concerned with its own internal issues, rightly so. And I thought, I feel that in our work, we, you know, to be honest, most of the places in which we work, we just have to argue that music is an economy um, in and of itself. And um, I can't stress that enough. And I'm still fighting that. Uh, a lot of my time is just proving things that are, are common sense. But one, one thing that we have seen in, in many parts of the world is that, you know, the classic, you, when you lose something, you suddenly realize it's important. And the analogy that we use when I'm speaking to, um, you know, government representatives is clean water is only important when you don't have it. So there's been a renewed interest in trying to understand the role of music in communities. Um, especially live music, given live music and venues have been the most impacted um, during the pandemic. But there, but we've seen us in many parts of the United States that the policy infrastructure is just, um, is not optimized, say, uh, so to speak, to get money into the hands of people who need it. And that's not a music problem. That's a, 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 a societal equity, you know, issue. Um, and we have seen that money has been available in certain parts of the U.S. for artists, music venues, music companies. Um, and they haven't had access to it, mainly through existing CARES funding, which Justin talked about, of the money that New York has to get rid of really quickly. So one of the things that we did working with Neva, um, uh, Moose and, and Hal and, and Dana and Cody and Austin as well, um, and the Music Business Association, the Recording Academy, NITO, the promoters and booking agents. Um, we created a CARES toolkit called CARES for Music, and we put it online for free, and we sent it to every state representative that we could, every county, every city, to, based on who's giving out CARES money. And we were able to um, get a little bit of movement in, we think, six or seven states around getting money out the door uh, to people who need it. But it does show the kind of structural inequity in the system. And it, to me, it comes down to the fact that music still is not wholly understood as an economy and as a um, uh, directly and directly and, and within communities. Um, and people see music as an ephemeral issue. It's something that you go and enjoy in that moment or you get lost in a song and you love that song. They don't recognize the the entire supply chain from what you guys do uh, in the music tech space through to, you know, the music teacher um, in a community hall and the economic value that that music teacher brings. So we have had some luck in some countries um, making, that mess, making that message heard. I've worked with the Music Venue Trust in a number of organizations in the UK um, here in a 1.57 billion pounds relief package for um, uh, was passed uh, a few months ago, and that involved all sorts of organizations. But the music venue lobby, especially the music venue trust, really were the um, were kind of the Neva of the UK in that in that regards. Uh, and that has helped a lot of businesses. And you know, cards on the table, it helped us as well with sound diplomacy. Um, and we and one of the things, and I'll kind of end it there to um, to ask. Any, any further questions uh, is, is that um, one of the things that we have seen, and I can show you an example, is a lot of cities and governments are coming to us and asking, what can we change to make life better for music venues, make life better for what we call the music ecosystem without spending any money? Because a lot of municipalities 
really are, are frankly broke or in debt um, and they're struggling to pay for basic utilities. So what we've been doing is um, we've been doing regulatory assessments and we're calling them music recovery strategies. And we've got 10 or 12 of them in the US on right now where we're working on policy guides for cities to, to present them with a host of um, ordinance reform um, that they can pass once. So we do all the ordinance reform in one fell swoop and then we go to city council once and say, you need to reform your loading zone policy, your parking policy, your zoning, your noise, um, street performance, um, all sorts of frankly boring things that matter. Um, and a, a success in this was in New South Wales and Australia in Sydney, where 63 regulations were amended at once in one vote um, across state government uh, to support um, the live music ecosystem with all sorts of really ridiculous rules like no disco balls were allowed in certain bars and certain genres were not allowed to be played in certain places. And that is down to um, prohibition laws from, you know, New York had a couple of years ago, right? With the cabaret licensing law, similar. So, um, and, and COVID actually was the reason why this was able to happen. It was a, a series of incredible work from a lot of people, but also a happy accident. And we believe that that's a great model where we can go to cities and, dem and, 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 and counties and states and whatever, and demonstrate that there's a lot that they can do to improve their regulatory infrastructure, to support music, so that music is recognized in all its forms and functions as, um, as a workforce development tool or as a business tool like any other sectors. And we are seeing movements. I just got off a call with the state of Delaware who are um, obviously galvanized by Biden's win, but they are really focused on, you know, what can we do to, um, to include me, um, not just music, but the wider creative economy in their economic development plan. And prior to speaking to us, the arts was one sentence in the state's economic development plan. Now they're asking for three or four pages. Uh, that probably wouldn't have happened without COVID. Uh, and, and this stuff really matters. Like if something isn't written in policy, then it doesn't exist. And we have to ensure that music is uh, recognized and represented as an economy and as an ecosystem in every community um, not just in America, but but everywhere. And that's what I'm trying to do um, with some level of success and, and some level of challenge. Um, but uh, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions uh, about kind of any, any other further specific things. Seth, I hope that was, um, that was good. That was amazing. Question. I'm not a team person, so you guys know that. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Luddite. Uh, you'll hear that about me, but, um, I'm, but one of the things just to say is we, uh, we are one of the, um, uh, tech solutions that is being deployed in a number of places, um, is simply, um, digital optimized permitting. I'm sure anyone, you know, I'm sure Justin can say, you know, permitting is a complete pain in the ass in most places, and you shouldn't have to get six different agencies to approve, um, uh, you know, your ability to trade as a business. So we're looking with communities at creating, um, you know, a online uh, permitting framework that makes things simpler and cheaper. We're actually, day, um, we're working with the city in Alabama actually on a pilot um, related to that. So that's an example of incorporating tech. Yeah, I think something like permitting is, I, I, I know New York is, is, is moving at, at, at whatever you know city wide kind of speed they can they can move at they're not like a startup right they're like more like a huge massive organization <laughs> to make change but um but yeah, something like permitting, digitizing permitting would just be a game changer <laughs> yeah it's digital in many regards but it's it's as as just to say in inspections it's it's such a human heavy bureaucratic process in so many places and it, when we're able to congregate, when we're able to have live music um, in, in, in safe confines in a way that is profitable for the promoter of the venue, then we have to ensure that there are no restrictions on their ability to trade. 
um, or minimal restrictions on their ability to trade. You know, I sound like a Republican, like I want pro-business policy here. And what I'm trying to do is, is, you know, you have to, you have to really dig into um, how cities work. And, and obviously New York is, is in a league of its own in so many regards, <laughs> including in terms of, I would say, uh, civic administration and bureaucracy. Right. But also, you know, what, I, what I'm seeing on the ground here in New York is that people, people have changed, <laughs> you know, um, I'm seeing a totally different New York. And I've lived here for over um, uh, yeah. over twenty I, years now. I'm 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 eternally hopeful and optimistic for 2021. I I'm not sugarcoating the challenges. Um, I know I know people who have lost their jobs and livelihoods, and it just absolutely sucks. And I count myself incredibly lucky that I that I have a job. Um, but you know. Mark Roach, who's the executive director of Music New Zealand, said that, you know, when it comes back, it's like an elastic band. You know, it snaps and, and you have to go from zero to 100 very quickly because everyone's starving for culture and right. starving for music. And, you know, but if we go back and we go back to normal with the regulations and the policies and the processes that um, that we had prior to COVID, then we're not going to be any better off in the future. Right. Can you share some some more examples of you know I, I think the United States is behind with COVID, unfortunately. Um, but are, are there other cities that that are now reopening that we, um, are doing things in a way that we should be doing it when when we well, get it's hard to, yeah you know New Zealand's been open for months uh, two months now Australia is now fully open. Um, but they have effective testing and tracing systems. There's been some good um, Primavera Pro in Spain. You know, the festival had a COVID safe trial today um, with, I think, 1,200 people, which was successful. Um, Glastonbury is looking, I know Glastonbury is in a bigger league, but they're looking at mass testing prior to the events. The, the solutions are there. Um, it's, it's sometimes we... You know, and in the UK, we're, we're, you know, I'm in lockdown right now. Uh, all bars and pubs are closed, uh, except for delivery and takeaway. Um, and, um, and, but still, you know, we, we have a, we have a system here where, you know, some payments like 80% of the salary of employees are covered here in, under our furlough scheme. So we're very lucky in the US. It's much harder, not only because of COVID, but because it's, you know, that there's no alignment anywhere. New York is New York, Boston is Boston. And they are like, you're like islands. I hope that, you know, organizations, and I believe that organizations like Neva and NITO and, um, and others, um, you know, I believe that we have a great opportunity to engage with like the US Conference of Mayors and, um, and cities organizations and the International Economic Development Council and all these organizations that I have to deal with despite having no expertise on how to deal with them, I just had to learn. I think in past, music was seen as a nice to have. And I think now we have this great opportunity to, you know, to promote it as a need to have. Yeah, and, and along those lines, you know, for for this, for the tech community, I mean, this is this is an event. It's being recorded. I hope I can share it out and get it into more people's um, inboxes. But uh, how how do we learn? How do we get more involved from you know from someone who's learning themselves? Like you know, is is, is it um, is it a good question? Like on a local level, should should we be going to our favorite venues nearby and kind of I, I know that there's a place here in, in Brooklyn called Barbez, which is almost like a landmark. And he right now is selling wine from his from his music venue. And that's how, you know, I can help him. <laughs> but yeah, as a you know, I, that's a good question. Yes, of course. Buying local, buying whatever you can. Uh, we're the same here, supporting our local businesses um, in London. I think we have to learn from it. And I think we are. 
um, this is the most unified the music industry has ever been, and it's not that unified. Also, we have to. This is under the backdrop that uh, you know a good portion of the music industry is doing really well right now and doesn't want anybody to know about it. <laughs> um, and we have to, you know. But I, I don't. I I think that's a good thing that someone's doing well. That doesn't mean you know it. I don't wish negativity on anybody. Um, but I think we have to. We ha if something is important to us, then it's then then we have to understand how it works. And then we have to try to show some empathy and explain to people how it works rather than get frustrated when they don't understand. And I've learned that I can't go into a, a city council meeting with a music mindset. I, and I've, I've learned that from, from screwing up multiple times um, and working. And I worked in the mayor's office um, in London. So I have some experience as well internally. Um, and I've had to learn how to translate value. So I can't tell you how many times I use this, the word workforce development. You know, I don't really know what it means. But I use that word all the fucking time. Pardon my friend. Uh, I, I, you know, um, I don't talk about supporting music for music's sake very often. Um, I talk about how music can make something else better, whether it's attracting talent, retaining talent, creating jobs more tax revenue, so on and so forth. That's, that's what I've learned. It works for me because my job is to sell music to non-music people, right? That's what Sound Diplomacy are. We're music people for non-music people. Um, and, and then I learn from, you know, people who are much, much smarter than me and who inspire me, people like Moose and Justin and Hal and Ariel and people I look up to. And I think that we also have to, I think that if we if we want to change, then we have to change the way we think about our involvement in our own ecosystems. Yeah, that's great. Well, Shane, thanks so much for joining us. Um, I, I'm going to use this as a segue to to bring it into Ariel, who we are all look yeah. up to here in New York. And um, I hope you can stick around for kind of the the session afterwards. Um, but. Uh, can't wait to see you in, in, in person. So thanks, Shane. All right, Ariel. Hey, Shane. Hey, Seth. Hey, Justin, if you're back there. <laughs> Good to see your face. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing OK. Yeah. How are you? I'm, 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 I'm doing OK, too. I've got the same kind of butterflies of hosting a real live person event that I'm having here with a, a virtual one. Um, but, you know, I reached out to you kind of through a cold email. I wasn't sure if you'd respond. I know you're very busy. So thank you so much for, for joining us. And, and I look forward to hearing what you have to share with, with us on Frontline here in New York. Well, thanks for the invitation. Um, and of course, you know, I uh, also have so much respect for Justin and for Shane and what they're doing on their front lines and what you're doing on your front line. And um, I appreciate you reaching out to me to be able to be part of this conversation. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously things are, are heavy and complicated here in New York and around the world. Um, a lot of people may or may not even know what the Office of Nightlife is or why it was created or how long it's been here, but it's only been about two and a half years since New York even had its created its first office of nightlife. And um, I think to Justin and Shane's point, the reason why it was created was to really elevate the necessity and the place of nightlife live music, dance clubs, hospitality in New York City to its rightful place of respect and appreciation. It's getting the support and the recognition that it needs to not only survive, but thrive. Um, this office was created as part of a global movement that uh, Shane is also a part of with his sound diplomacy report that he created to help give a blueprint for offices like this. 
pre-pandemic, this industry was not seen as an asset, but as a liability, as a nuisance, something to be uh, enforced upon, a criminal element, so to speak. So the very fact that New York, among other global partners like London, Amsterdam, Berlin, created an office of nightlife in and of itself is, it was a acknowledgement that it is important to the economy, to the culture, um, to society itself. And um, I think now, again, to the earlier point, you don't really know what you have till it's gone. It's really more stark than ever how many jobs, how much money, how much vitality and safety is dependent on its existence. So, you know, I think uh, Justin shared some of the numbers. I mean, this this industry supports over 300,000 jobs, you know, $35.1 billion, 300,000 in tax revenue. So, it has to be seen as an economic engine, but also uh, that is a way sort of to translate its power to people that don't understand how important it is to be in a small room with a good band or to get on a dance floor or what it means for the culture and for the families, the nightlife families <laughs> um, that are created on the ground. So. That's why this office was created. It was to help reframe um, and elevate its position. And obviously, when um, COVID hit, that position still remains. We are still here to make sure that it is uh, that it has a seat at the table every single day as we have pivoted from support and and elevating the industry into full-blown crisis management right so um we've taken our position the relationships that we've built over the last two and a half years under me personally as a former you know nightclub owner in the east village i also had to sort of pivot my brain and to understand, to Shane's point, how you go from a music lover, a nightclub owner into government to speak their language and to understand how things work. So I was able, and we were able to do that in order to pivot into this crisis mode and to be able to make sure that this industry is heard every single day where the decisions are being made. So whether it be just trying to create outdoor seating, um, which I think New York did pretty well as a lifeline to the restaurants and other venues. Um, we also know that a lot, if not most of the dance clubs and live music venues haven't even been open since March at all and are hanging by a thread. And so from the inside of government, we have a position to keep beating the drum and to make sure that this industry is always at the forefront of the decisions and the considerations that are being made um, and having a representative there at all times. So I'm really grateful that this office was created um, and right on time really to be able to, to do that. From this position, We've also been able to support what is going on outside of the administration, like with NEVA and NIVA and the Save Our Stages Act, the Restaurants Act, um, in order for New York to be able to officially um, support that, in order for our Office of Nightlife to be able to uh, fully push that um, message to the delegation, to Congress, to everyone who would listen, it was also essential that the mayor himself understood what Save Our Stages Act is and that he support it first. So we were able to help bring um, 
the attention of Save Our Stages to the mayor to have him write a letter in support of it in order to be able to get it to Chuck Schumer, in order to be able to get it to the delegation, uh, congressional delegation, and so that we also had the green light to be able to um, support it wholeheartedly and loudly the way it needs to be, the way New York should be uh, supporting it. Um, and, you know, from a sort of nuts and bolts aspect, this office, you know, it, it does it does have a lot of um, resources and power to be able to help, but it also has, you know, not enough. I don't think there's not there's not enough for anyone right now. You know, we're all in this position. We're doing the best we can with the resources that we have. Uh, to Shane's earlier point, the city itself is in a financial crisis. It doesn't have the money to financially bail out all the workers and the venue owners the way I know I would like to and it would like to, um, which is why it's so important that we are able to support the federal uh, stimulus effort to be able to advocate for that. But on a sort of everyday basis, what we've been able to do and what we're trying to do is just to make sure that all of the operators who are open um, are getting the information and the regulations and the guidelines that they need. Um, those who are not open, we are in touch with them regularly to also make sure that we are hearing every aspect of what they are thinking and doing in order to be able to amplify what they're saying and what they need into the house of government where decisions are being made. We've done a lot of work with the workers as well, especially workers out of work. We actually just hosted um, one of many town calls, we're calling them town halls, virtual town halls, um, to make sure that people know all the resources that they that the city has to offer, whether it be um, for food security, free health care, mental health um, support, you know, depression prevention. <laughs> um, a lot of like the sort of everyday resources that people will need to help weather the storm. We know there's light at the end of the tunnel, but we also know the next three months are going to be brutal. So how do we prepare for that from a worker or a musician or artists, DJs that are out of work right now, you know, having to give them some kind of lifeline? Um, we're also, you know, to Justin's earlier point, the State Liquor Authority has a lot of rules uh, that are restricting gathering and promoting and ticketed events. There's a special um, uh, ban on comedy and a special ban on karaoke and exotic dancing. And interestingly, what I've learned is that it's actually not from the State Liquor Authority, but from the Department of Health. So when you ask or talk to the State Liquor Authority about it, they say talk to the Department of Health. Um, but people in the comedy world are really suffering, you know, especially in a time of um, this election uh phase and not being able to speak and to do satire. I mean, I understand from them, it's really about freedom of speech, you know, for them to be able to share and speak on that. Um, so we try to amplify the concerns of the entire industry to make sure that, you know, why it's hurting them, why it's not um, why it's overly restrictive is is needs to be reconsidered. Um, I mean, there's also, I would mention just the fact, to Shane and Justin's point, the fact that Neva was created, there's also like 10 smaller uh, alliances and coalitions that have been created in New York um, through this crisis that 
have been incredible in organizing the venue operators, the workers, the performers. We're in touch with them on a regular basis. And I really do think that, and I believe that they will stay um, post COVID to really strengthen this industry to make sure that forevermore it is getting the exposure, respect and support that it, that it needs and deserves. Um, I'll also mention just to backtrack about the advocacy work with Save Our Stages. After the city was officially behind it, we were also able to, or I was able to do an op-ed with uh, council member Justin Brannon um, to uh, write in support of the act in Variety Magazine. And I just think all of us really need to organize and get together and work together as we've been doing because, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the oil as they say. And so New York, not just New York, but nightlife in general, to Justin's point, um, has the mailing lists, has the promoters, has the reach. This industry itself is, um, its greatest strength is organizing and galvanizing people. This is what they do the best. And so to have this collective mission, um, it's the partnership between outside of government and then the Office of Nightlife having a seat inside government and making sure we're all pushing in the same direction, pushing the same buttons, talking to the same people. It's having that sort of inside, outside, surround sound effort to get what this industry needs to survive is I think the best way that we're going to be able to accomplish it. That's amazing. Um, using, but that's in a nutshell. Using music community. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> please share. So, yeah, I mean, what we've also seen obviously in you know, I hear Justin loud and clear. There is no replacement for live experience, uh, for getting on a dance floor, for listening to live music so it fills every cell in your soul. Um, but what we've also seen out of necessity is like the pivot, the instant pivot into the virtual world, the DJs and the parties and the clubs and the musicians. Um, Everyone's like, when's nightlife or going to be back? I was like, well, they're sort of just kept going on a different track. When will it be back live is another story, but it's still sort of out there in the virtual world. Um, so I personally would love to be able to see the, the music tech community find ways to help support the independent artists and venues to better monetize and promote especially when affiliated, let's say, with a, a, a venue, um, seeing, you know, people put their Venmos up, you know, I would love to see a platform that provides more um, organized way with even a little bit more dignity on how to monetize and, and to uh, compensate art online and to be able to promote it and to network it. Um, what, like we saw with WeStream, um, around the world with in Berlin, I think there's a lot of value to also being able to see music and hear DJs and visit venues around the world um, on these virtual platforms. But I think there that it would be also worthwhile to see how we can really develop the virtual aspect, um, VR and being able to sort of try and evolve into a more immersive, uh, more dimensional experience as we globe trot and bar hop and club hop around the world yeah. uh, virtually. Like, so those are my- so As we've all kind of entered the virtual event space, when we return, it, can there be a merging of the two where it comes back to, you know, I might, it reminds me of, tuning into like boiler room DJ events in mm -hmm. Berlin and 
and uh, if, you know, if I had a younger version of myself, like wanting to then go and, and visit those those venues, but using the, the virtual as a gateway into the the physical, um, but being able to connect those two. I don't know. I'm, now I'm just you've got me brainstorming now. <laughs> well, isn't that the point of this today? Yeah. Was how technology could support. Um, how it could save our stages. And I think, you know, from just a practical standpoint, we really need to think about multiple streams of revenue, right? And, and if there is a way to promote it, uh, your music, your venue, that's always paramount, but to also be able to really figure out how to add a very strong additional stream of, of revenue into venues and to artists, I think is a noble cause. Yeah, I mean, our venues opening up for non-audience type of events, are there, can, are there is, is that a legal thing that can start to happen now? Uh, and are they doing it's it? Been it's been, it's been happening. Yeah, a lot of venues because production, film and television production has its own set of guidelines and rules and regulations and allowances that are not necessarily aligned with um, venues at all. It's only just about space and what happens in that space. And so we have seen a lot of venues using their spaces, renting them out, um, and being able to stream artists and DJs from those venues. I don't know what's going to happen if there's a full lockdown again and pause, which is in the air right now uh, for after Christmas or after New Year's. But if the city is open to a certain degree, then it's allowed. Yep. So folks, do you have questions? Um, for Ariel, or if Shane and Justin also want to turn on their cameras again, we could maybe make it a more of a group chat. Um, you know, I, I had one question where where Justin brought up um, that the state has close to a billion dollars that they're trying to spend before the end of the year. I mean, how do we spend that? <laughs> or is there a reason why we're not spending that? Um, what's your What's your take on that, Ariel? Well, um, firstly, we, our office is with the city and under the mayor. And very often people will be like, well, the city's doing this. Actually, it's the state that's doing that. So we are, whereas we're still on this in the same team, we're, you know, in different locker rooms, so to speak. Um, but this billion dollars that they've been holding, um, you know, obviously we have our ideas of where they should spend it. We want people to, you know, be able to get funding to be able to close and hibernate, I think, for the winter. To Justin's earlier point, most venue operators I speak to don't want to um, demand to be open and demand to have live music and dance clubs and so forth. They want to be, have saved, they want everybody to be safe. Nobody wants that um, responsibility of making sure everyone's safe. If we could help people through rent subsidies or assisting them to stay closed while we ride this storm out, I mean, I think that would be a great way to help, but Purse strings are not in my hands. <laughs> Got it. Um, I feel like that. I'm sure Justin has talked about it. <laughs> Where how they should spend it. Justin, what do you have a? You're you're on mute. Can't hear you. Here, I'll, I'll, I'll pick your microphone I, for I you. There's a question, Seth. While Justin figures it out, if you want. Yeah, please. Yeah, uh, well, it, it's um, the rule. The the rules when the you know this money is part of part of cares that goes to the states and cities, right, Justin? And and the rules were oh, we lost him. Um, and essentially, every state got a certain amount of money based on amount of people that live in the state, and then that got um, some of it went to the states, went to cities. And it's very, very complicated. 
And in, in one way, a lot of cities simply didn't have the programs or the capacity to spend the money. So they didn't, they didn't have the granting programs available. They had to create them. In other states, uh, it's purely political, but we have seen some states hold on to the money, hoping that Congress will change the law, allowing them to then spend the money on their budget shortfalls in 2021. So on their unemployment, on their Medicaid, things like that. So that's one of the reasons why. So like Alabama held on to everything until like two weeks ago. And then they only, um, they only put out a, what it was a $300 million uh, small business loan scheme when they have like one point some odd billion to spend because the, the Republicans are holding on to it, hoping that the Republicans will win the seats in Georgia in January and then they'll be able to uh, apparently change the rules so that they can use the money for their budget shortfalls. That's what I've heard. So I don't know. I'm sure Justin knows more than me about that. I, I think that was sort of the play for this the state was that the hopes that the, the can you hear me? Is this working yes. now? Okay. Yeah. Good. Um, the hopes that the regulations were going to change or the there was going to be an extension to the deadline of how they could how when and how they could use the funds that were um, provided by the CARES Act. There was a, there were restrictions in March that were set on how they can use this money. For example, they can't use any of the CARES Act budget to fill um, like like um, tax budget gaps or anything like that that would potentially not be related to the pandemic. Um, and yeah, so I think now a lot of states have realized like that's not gonna happen. And they're, they're, they're like, they're scrambling to figure out how to allocate these funds. Um, the, the, the thing is a lot of, um, the other problem is that a lot of these funds that have been allocated, they, that they haven't used the, the organizations that, that they've been allocated, the funds have been allocated to, um, haven't used the full amount or needed the full amount. And then that brings money back into the state that then can also spend it on something else. So doing this really last minute is also frustrating because it's guaranteed that there's gonna be money that's going back um, because just of whatever programs they have, not, not needing all of it. Um, so that's why it's really important right now, um, this campaign, the For Sale by New York campaign, to, to really press the, the state in trying to release some of these of this billion dollars that's left over or the venues, um, but for us, it's really, we need to make sure that venues can survive until the federal stimulus is passed. So we're not asking for a tremendous amount of money for the whole industry, for the whole state, $75 million is um, not gonna change anything much in terms of the state budgets, but it will have a huge impact in the future of, of live music. And it's a very easy thing for Cuomo to do. And it's it'll be a good look too. I mean, if he's got to shut things down, it's a great way for him to show support. I mean, look at the way um, Chuck Schumer has been wearing his hat and the mask everywhere, save our stages, because it's a really easy way to connect with their constituents. Like, it's like a no brainer. Like, I, so I, I'm just trying to, we have a call, we have a call with this, someone from the state later this week, and it would be great to have a lot of the momentum behind it with the, with the public campaign that we're trying to get out, so. You guys do an incredible job, by the way. I mean, it's just a, what you guys have accomplished with Save Our Stages has absolutely just blown my mind to see Chuck Schumer going into the meetings with McConnell with the Save Our Stages mask in the last couple of days. I've just been like, filled with so much pride and am so impressed with everything you guys have accomplished from just out of pure necessity and passion and determination. So I personally just having you in front of me have to share just like mad respect for every single thing that you guys have done and we're behind you all the way. Just have to say Thank that. You. Yeah, it's really it's really just the, the, the whole association coming to get really working together. Um, we have uh, within the association, there is like a, a committee that, that, that we call them precinct captains that are focused on each state. And um, they're just being a venue operator, you're so sort of 
within the more locality side of things, you, you're definitely participating on the local level with governments just to try to open, right? You need to get your um, neighborhood associations to to give you the thumbs up, otherwise you won't get the liquor light. So all these or all these groups just were just kind of like hunkered down for the past six or seven months and pulled every, you know, stop that we've had in terms of contacts and um, in the artist side of things and our, our lists and yeah it's it showed that we, we could make some waves which was like you know a relief that we might be, like succeeding here with the sos um and now it's time for the state to new york it's new york i mean come on the cultural capital of the world right we're trying to call it that that's like <laughs> the bucks to the, to the you know the, the folks that help make it that way that's all <laughs> i mean it's it, ariel i you know from from what the mayor's office and what can be done on the on the city level i it's a it's definitely a different sort of challenge and and that's why i think we haven't been focusing our ask there um although with this next package there is a chance there's a smaller chance that the that the cities will be getting some sort of relief package and it might be possible at that point to consider music venues um you know, we need to also make sure that our place in line makes sense you know people need to have food in their mouths first and foremost and 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 any of the you know the healthcare workers need what they they need to survive and, and the, the basic um quality of life needed in the city has to be taken care of first but um it's just uh it, it's i i do think we're a worthwhile investment um yeah so, <laughs> well no. the conversation is to be continued right it doesn't uh it doesn't live and die on a zoom call like the conversation needs to happen every day and we need to stay in close touch you know all of us do to make sure that we're keeping the momentum moving in the right direction i fully agree and if i could do more of these events i will i mean if you know if if I think you're right. It's just a matter of keeping that conversation going, and the, all the hard work that you guys are doing is is um, is just amazing and inspiring to to see from afar. And I, I'm so I'm so glad to have been able to put this event together today. I, if there's anyone that came to also network, feel free to click on that networking tab, and you get put into these one-on-one, -on -one, um, five-minute. Uh, net, like speed dating type networking situations. Um, I also don't mind keeping this conversation going a little bit longer if you all have time, um, but I wanted to mention that as well. I mean, I, you know, so another question I have is like, how do you guys envision New York changing after this? Like what if there is, is, is there a vision five years out or 10 years out for a different New York that, that is, more venue friendly or there's more i i know one of the the big things that shane loves to talk about is how it it is the music teacher in you know your local community center that helps foster the growth of an ecosystem it's much it goes beyond just the venues right the independent venues it's 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 from the ground up for you know i have a a five-year-old daughter who's learning to sing and play guitar and making sure that she's starting on kind of that that path to eventually maybe one day she will play at Le Poisson Rouge 10 years from now like is there do you guys have a vision for for like a, a different New York after after all this has passed different? Or just, I don't know or uh or, or better, better than ever, maybe. <laughs> well I mean listen I mean it it would be unfortunate if um, New York and it's the entire ecosystem of, of uh, music and venues in the city itself doesn't evolve and grow um, through this collective pain that we are in together. I think it's essential to be able to learn the lessons um, along the way and to see where the opportunities are to course correct because an office of nightlife wasn't
you know, gated because really headed in the right direction before in a lot of ways, whether it be commercial rent, whether it be the cost of doing business, whether it be summonses and fines, whether it be racist store policies and booking policies and venues, whether it be, um, you know, I, I, I just think you can't move, you can't change the tires on a moving car, so to speak. The car is stopped right now. We have an opportunity to really dig deep. I think once we financially stabilize and we know that the future um, is a more secure um, to really start paying attention to the ways we can reemerge from this more conscious, um, more deliberate and um, more, you know, just more, um, more positive industry that uh, is really yep. looking out for each other yeah. and, uh, yeah. and, and more, more sustainable. Rich, right? I mean, go ahead. I, yeah. I think, well, you can't get more yeah, you know, I'm rich in London, the... and, and one thing that I think London and New York both share is that if we don't change the way we act, then we're both going to be underwater pretty soon. Um, so, you know, one thing that is important to me and that we're really thinking about is, um, is really thinking about the definition of the word sustainability across the music industry and across everything that we do. Like, and I think a city has to think that way too. So, you know, retrofitting uh, facilities and not just venues, but any, any, anything within the built environment, um, um, anything that's built that's new needs to be done in a way that is properly sustainable um, and really ensuring that any policy that has been used to promote um, inequality or racism or anything that discriminates against anybody um, is is removed uh, from the books and you know I think that, that and and I don't think that we have the wherewithal as a society to think about that yet right and we're really crap at existential problems humans suck at solving things that we can't see so like I feel that this gives us an opportunity and in cities like London and New York and London and New York share a lot of similarities and we're different but in terms of how we treat our music and nighttime economy, in many regards, we're quite similar. Other than here, we, we have more money here uh, to give to venues. Um, uh, but um, I think that that's something that, you know, once we get back to norm, whatever normal is going to be, that's, I'm hoping that we can sit back and think, okay, well, you know, pre-COVID things weren't that great. We can be so much better. And I'm hoping that's around climate, around equality, and around, you know, exploring multiple definitions of the word sustainability. And and on that note, I have to go. I've got I've got potatoes that I have to drain on the stove. So <laughs> so, uh, it's like ten to eight. I'm wow. cooking dinner as well. Um, thank you guys, thank oh, yeah, you guys so much uh, for having me. It's I good also to see all you guys. Uh, and yeah. Happy holidays. We'll be yes. in touch. Happy, Happy holidays. holidays. Thanks, Shane. That's right. Bye, boy. See you on the flip Happy side. Holidays. All right. Well, I think we can wrap it up. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thanks Good so much. This up. has been super inspiring. I yeah. feel quite honored to have been able to chat with all of you. And um, I will be posting this on our website and helping spread the word. And hopefully we can do it again soon. Um, Hopefully yeah. with a victory lap of yeah. Save Our Stages. All right. Keep me posted. I will be happy to spread anything out to All my right. community that you guys want to share, too. Thanks so much, Seth, Thanks, for organizing Danielle. this. Good to Thanks, see you, Justin. See you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Keep in touch. <laughs>